88, I remember Ultramagnetic did the uh, mixed feeling it in there. Mm -hmm. And I, I was curious because the Fat Boys getting, and then we go into 1988, that was to me the explosion commercially, creatively, the first real sustained explosion in rap was 88 because we had had these we'd had movements and breakthroughs and different things, but did you notice when ultra magnetic and then Dougie fresh and these different people were starting to come into D and D, did you feel like a sense of like, man, something different is happening. The business, sure. the business is expanding. Like, what did you feel? Well, it's also hot 97 kind of changed its format at that point. And then red alert was doing mix shows and, you know, so New York was changing and it wasn't as, like the Latin hip hop that we were doing was very prevalent on hot 97 and, you know, those groups. And then when it kind of changed, it changed that D and D. And also, you know, once Primo got there and it started being mostly hip hop, you know, the other stuff kind of faded out. Uh, not entirely, you know, but we really started doing hip hop most of the time. And it was a sign of the times. It was a sign of hip hop growing. It was a sign in New York. It was what was happening. Uh, so we went with it. Okay. And the first time, uh, given your connection with 45 King, the first time I remember connecting the dots with D&D &D and 45 King, or an early one, I should say, that wasn't his normal thing, was the Dougie Fresh Summertime. Um, so what that record and Dougie Fresh in general exists in so many different worlds that are seemingly unconnected. And then of course he was on D and D all stars much later. Yep. But, but with 45 King with Dougie Fresh, with the get fresh crew, even Todd Terry on there as well. What, um, what was enabled that to be so separate and distinctive compared to a lot of what was going on in rap at the time? Well, the, those guys had their own vibe, you know, it, it was just, they, they were doing their own thing. They weren't following the path. And, and again, the path was just being cut. If you look at D&D &D and a lot of the records that were done there, um, it was that group's breakout record. It was like one of their first records that really, uh, took them to the next level. So a lot of these cats, when they first came in, were just recently signed. It was their first album, first single. And so they were just feeling their way through it as well. Um, but if you really look at it, uh, a lot of those guys, their big record that broke them and they went on to fame was recorded at the end. Um, a lot to that. Yeah. But again, uh, listen, we didn't have a place where we dictated anything. It was the style of the artist, the producer, and their comfort level, and they wanted a certain sound, and, and, and that's why they were there. Okay. And they were there also, from what I understand and what we've learned over the years, it was a, it was a social place. It became home for a lot of people. It was a, a way to interact with other artists. If you're in the B room with Primo and then Lost Boys are in A, then everyone meets in the lounge and they collaborate, they talk, they, oh, what's going on? You know, that kind of uh, real vibe of, of a recording studio lounge where everybody caught up and it was a family. And it, it you know, it, it just uh, really turned into even a bigger family. And, and that was a big part. Also, cats could roll deep at D&D. &D. Like when MOP came up, they came up deep, deep. Uh, Lost Boys, you know, they didn't come four guys. They came, you know, really heavy. And not every studio was conducive to that. We had a really big, uh, we had basically had a pool room and a big lounge. And then each uh, studio, studio A and Studio B and Studio D had their own little personal lounges. So like if Primo didn't want to come out and deal with uh, whoever, uh, he had his own lounge. And uh, if uh, people wanted to play pool, whatever was going on, they'd come out and do the, you know, the big lounge, and that's where everyone would eat and play CeeLo and catch up and, you know, really shoot the shit. 
And what, what enabled you or made you guys willing to embrace that? It's just who we were. You know, I had just come back from Jamaica. So I, I was living down there in, uh, in a roster world, um, which I got so much from and I enjoyed so much. And I just saw that vibe and, uh, you know, it was a community. It was peaceful. Doug had just got out of an internship at another recording studio. So he got the real gist of what the studio life was about and things he saw that he didn't like and he did like. And we just implemented uh, what we thought would work in, in the comfort level of musicians because uh, m- music imitates life, as you know. So you, you got to be in a comfortable, if you're coming from the projects and all of a sudden you're in this sterile environment and, uh, you know, you can't smoke, you can't, which a lot of studios were at that point because they were doing Ajax ads in Studio A and then these guys are in Studio B. So I think there was a big level of comfort where they knew they were at home and they could create their music in the style that was conducive for them. Right. And, and speaking of Jamaica, that that's when you were with uh, Peter Tosh. Uh, yeah. So as a person what did you learn and what effect did he have on you that shaped who you became? Peter was a very interesting guy. You know, he was very strong and he was, uh, he was the Bush doctor, you know, he was, he led his crew. He was, he was the man and he was very demanding. Um, He liked all his tracks laid, like almost a finish mix before he would go and do vocals, which was to this day pretty unusual. You know, usually the vocals are done first and then you create around that. And Peter wasn't like that. He liked to really hear what was going on. Um, I worked with an incredible engineer, Chris Kimsey, who was one of the greatest producer engineers of all time. Um, And I was really green. I, I wasn't doing a lot. I was setting up mics and, you know, that kind of stuff. It was a real beginning for me in learning the the real art of engineering and and dealing with people. And, but Peter, you know, when I was first there, I think he considered me Babylon. If you know what that is, you know, you know, I'm not part of the culture and, uh, um, but we grew to, uh, you know, have a mute. Certainly I had beyond respect for him. Um, In fact, uh, he came to D and D once. Um, and that was a great experience, even though he just came and dubbed some tapes uh, to bring back home. Um, but we became, you know, I don't say we were really friendly, but we we were friendly to a degree, you know. And, and I lived down there, so I was just down there. So if people were going out at the, the studio or they they went someplace, I would roll with them. And, uh, you know, I was just part of part of that for a while. How many years were you there? I was there, uh, I was there about five months. I came home from my sister's wedding and then I went back for about five or six months. So I was there about a year. About a year. Okay. Gotcha. What an experience though, you know, and I love smoking herb. I I was a big Bob Marley, Peter Tosh fan going in. So for me, it was just the most dream scenario to go live in Jamaica and learn my craft with these people and just great people. Donald Kimsey was a the guitarist. He was he was from America. He was also Bob's guitarist. So him and I lived together because everyone else was from Jamaica. And he was a wonderful, brilliant guy who taught me a lot. And uh, you know, it was just a great experience uh, about the Rastafarian culture. Got very deep into, and you know, I can almost write a book about what it really is. And uh, you know, I totally respect it. So. Right. Now, with being overseas, it's interesting because one of the, the guys that I know that recorded overseas early and then came to D&D was the jazz um, because he was recorded his first album in, in London or England. And then, oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then when uh, To Your Soul, the second album, he was working on that. He did some of it, several songs at least at D&D. <clears throat> so did you... Well, I guess you then didn't talk to him about being overseas, but with jazz, <clears throat> because jazz is an artist and a producer, 
when you had that level of thing where he was doing more than one thing creatively, um, did you talk to him in any detail or like see something in special in him? Well, certainly, you know, he came out on D&D Records. We signed him as an artist. Uh, so we thought jazz was, you know, he's, one, he's an incredible MC. Uh, what he says, the way he says it, his flow, you know, Hawaiian selfie. I mean, at that point, his flow was second to none. I mean, he was just so brilliant. Um, you know, but he, he had his own philosophy and his own way of looking at stuff. And he was a, a seasoned guy at that point. And we didn't get too crazy on sending him in a, in a direction uh, of his records. Um, so, you know, it was a great experience. Uh, our, our, our situation with jazz, but uh, I don't think he influenced kind of the direction of D&D. Um, and obviously his relationship with Jay was very important. Right. In fact, I have loaded, uh, some of the most early Jay stuff ever that, that jazz produced that we, we pulled off of a two inch that we were about to throw away. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. I was just playing for someone yesterday. Um, and, uh, you know, so that relationship obviously helped us and, uh, you know, jazz was uh, one of a kind for sure. Absolutely. Because I know, even though uh, the uh, one of the early times I remember when I was looking back was the originators was mixed at the end, even though it was yeah. recorded there. Sure. And I, and I always wondered if at all that had any role with, since Jay was with him all the time, if that helped with Jay-Z being there later or. I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. Yeah. But, you know, I think also Jay at that point, you know, was coming for Prem. You know, that 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 kind of transitioned into, you know, I, if I want to get a Prem track, I got to go there. Yes. Definitely. As Nas said. <laughs> yeah. So with with Daily Operation with Gangstar, that that was uh, recorded and mixed at D&D. And in my opinion is a phenomenal record, but once, uh, because other than the Fat Boys, you had done a lot of mixing, remixing, songs, different things, but when Gangstar really recorded there and made the album there, how did you see the vibe or the reality of the studio change, if at all? Well, don't forget there was the whole Gangstar Foundation. So when Prem and, and Guru came in, uh, talking about Rolling Deep, I mean, they had the same cats. They just, they didn't have just hanger honors. Wasn't like, you know, half of Brooklyn was up there, but they, they had group home. J. Ru Afu uh, was there with J. Ru, Big Shug. They had, you know, and many, many other people that aren't MCs, but were an intricate part of their family and crew. So, uh, and they were in there most of the time because they went from one album to the next to the next. You know, they did an album, they got another deal or they had a five album deal, whatever it was, and they kept producing. And in between, Prem started doing the other stuff. Um, but it just became, they were there five, six, seven days a week. Um, so uh, whatever they wanted, whatever Prem wanted, hey, you know, we need blunts in the the vending machine for some reason that became such lore and so famous that we have blunts in the vending machine i mean it's i still read about it it's funny i just saw a picture of my vending machine with the and there weren't roll blunts it wasn't like uh amsterdam it was just blunts that you could take it and, and, and roll whatever you want i think people get it misconstrued that we had a uh, pre-roll blunts that, that would drop out yeah, but you know we, we we had what they wanted uh you know, whatever it was, coffee, water, anything that, that made it more comfortable for them to work within reason. Uh, you know, Prem is so easy. He's just, he wasn't really, he just wanted the equipment to work and, and a place to do it and have his own private space. Again, the B room, there were two doors you, you had to go through till you got to him. So we were very conscious of, uh, you know, 
making sure he had his privacy and because people all day, oh, Preems and B, let me go in there, you know, whoever it was, if they're coming from Europe, if they were anybody, the, everybody wanted to stick their head in. So I was kind of the gatekeeper. And, uh, if Prem wasn't busy, I'd say, hey, you mind if uh, these guys from Germany are up here and they just want to see the room for a second? And in 99, unless he was deep into something, he would always say, of course, I'll bring them in. And it okay. was just, that's just who he is, you know. Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip-hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.